Well, well, well. We meet again, old friend. Two teams from separate divisions, but less than 300 miles apart. The pair share quite the history. Right now, we're set for another showdown between the Raleigh Flyers and the DC Breeze. But only one can survive in advance to next week's AUDL semifinals. Oh, goodness! Miscommunication in the backfield. Huck goes up immediately. DC's got it. It's Kevin Versteeg. Versteeg, crossfield intercepted oh. by Fairfax. And now the clock is DC's enemy. Yannick shoots it for Fisher. Will this be the dagger? Fisher's got it. He's in, and the Flyers lead by three with under a minute to play. And it's disappointment and devastation for DC. And the Raleigh Flyers are going back to championship weekend. In 2021, DC thought they were the team of destiny. Carolina, meanwhile, fulfilled theirs. Welcome to opening weekend of the highly anticipated 2023 AUDL season. But there is a reason why they are called old friends. When they get together, it's simply unforgettable. It's gonna be short, Coffin and deflex it, and it is caught! Jacob Fairfax with a miraculous buzzer beater to take us to half! And it may have taken two years, with many new faces on either side, but the Breeze got their payback. The uh, lopsided five goal win in the record books is DC's biggest ever win over Carolina as the Breeze get the road dub to start the 2023 season. It's the Flyers and the Breeze for another reunion on AUDL.TV. We are simulcast on AUDL.TV and YouTube tonight from our nation's capital as the Flyers and Breeze meet again the next chapter between these two interdivisional rivals in the American Ultimate Disc League. It's a hot and steamy night in D.C., but it's so great to have you with us. Welcome to Free Friday Frisbee. I'm Evan Lepler with the voice of the Breeze, Tyler Byram, with the Ulti World Czar, Charlie Eisenhood. And gentlemen, these two teams met five weeks ago. D.C. won by five. Charlie, the Flyers are certainly a different team now than they were a month ago. I think you got to throw it out week one. we got to look at this Flyers team that's added back a lot of their firepower, including a couple members of the freshly minted UNC college champions to their roster tonight. This will be a lot more like what we expected to see back in week one. Hard to believe it was just four days ago that we were in Ohio watching Carolina win it again. The D.C. Breeze coming off a, a win over Toronto on the road two weeks ago. Tyler, what have been your impressions of the ascendance of this D.C. team through the first month? Yeah, well, for D.C., they're a team that historically have all been about their offense, and their offense being the dominating force that has really propelled them to their success over the past several years. This year, there's some new faces that have come into town, some new players getting moved around over to defense, and their defense has actually been the one running the show. So now it's all about them finding the right rhythm and getting those two lines connecting at the right point in the season. No David Cranston, no Jasper Tom for the D.C. defense tonight, so we'll see if the defense can continue being the the thing that gets this team going, like it got them going against the Flyers back in April. But look, Jacob Fairfax is a familiar name in this rivalry, Charlie, and we saw the miraculous buzzer beater grab he had in game one this year. He's having arguably the best start to the season of his entire career. He's been so fantastic. You know, whether you want to look at him leading the team in plus minus, coming down with the big plays when they need the most. I think what's interesting about Fairfax is that he's, he's evolved his game. He used to be more of a continuation thrower, come underneath, hit the hucks deep. Now he's taking advantage of his ability as one of the best bigs in the league. And he only has three turnovers this season through five games. Capable of the incredible highlight anytime the disc is in the air. And you could say the same thing, Tyler, about Christian Boxley. What has impressed you the most about the way he's leveled up in 2023? He's just so confident in stepping into this new role, knowing that Rowan McDonald, who was the MVP of this team for so long, 
moving over to the D-line, he has really been the one that has, the straw that has stirred the drink of the offense, really getting them to push the disc down the field. And he is a player that he likes to have the disc in his hand and then just go. The immediate acceleration, that's something that Coach Daryl Stanley loves about him is that they can put him in a handler spot, lull the defense to sleep, and then get him streaking down the field and a target in the end zone. It's amazing how many times he's uncontested in the end zone, just getting the separation, but obviously he can win a one-on-one -on -one battle in the air as well. Beautiful night for Ultimate. Saul Yannick lost his sunglasses, but he'll be ready to go. We're expecting to see Saul play a bit more defense tonight. Joe White's going to move on to the O-line. Could match up with Rowan McDonald. It's going to be a fun evening. We got a mega cast on AUDL.TV and YouTube. The Flyers and the Breeze opening poll coming up. Our free Friday Frisbee is presented by B Ultimate. Elevate your game with B Ultimate's premium performance-based apparel. B's cutting-edge jerseys are expertly crafted with flat-lock seams and quick-dry materials that'll keep you comfortable and performing at your best, no matter the conditions. Level up your game and visit shop.beultimate.com today. And we're also presented by Manscaped, the official grooming partner of the AUDL the ultimate grooming experience for the ultimate athlete. Visit manscaped.com to see their full suite of grooming products today. Less than a minute away from opening pull, the D.C. Breeze and the Carolina Flyers want to welcome in the fourth member of our broadcast crew, our sideline analyst, former coach of this D.C. team, Will Smolinski. Will, I know you were at Breeze practice on Wednesday. What are the things that you're looking for in this matchup tonight between these two powerhouse programs? Talk about familiarity in the open, I think is really interesting because from week one, these teams do look very different. The addition of Ben Ort has added some deep game element for DC. Moving Thomas Edmonds over to the D-line today instead of playing O-line like he did in week one. Also on the side of Carolina, they have they've been running this system where they don't really have a true O and D line and watching their game last week in Houston versus week one, it's almost like two totally separate teams. So even though there is a lot of familiarity here, Anders Jungst and Johnny Malks played high school ultimate together. Even before the game, Tyler Monroe and Saul Yannick were like having this back and forth about back in the day with uh, YCCs. Uh, you know, there is that little bit of a difference that wasn't quite there a couple weeks ago. Yeah, it's Great points. We'll look forward to hearing from you on the sidelines all night long. It is hot, almost 88 degrees. We like to be very precise on Free Friday Frisbee. I don't believe it. Uh, it up. You think <laughs> hotter than that. It's hotter than that. <laughs> Certainly feeling like summer here in the nation's capital. Yes, indeed. The feels like might be higher than that, indeed. Rowan McDonald, there's been so much conversation about Rowan. Should he play O? Should he play D? He actually was on offense for their win up in Toronto, but that was primarily because they were missing so many key offensive cutters like Christian Boxley. So Rowan's back on D-line tonight. And, of course, on Ulti World this past week, there was a great statistical analysis done by your AUDL stat maven, Paul Vertstack, about how the pull has changed the efficiency for both offense and defense this year. And, through five weeks, 49 games, the numbers are noticeable. Yeah, you, you, you can tell that it's really helping out the defense to be able to get that disc in the air a little bit longer, get the defense down there, and put some pressure on the offense early in the possession. Matt Gushohannis catches the opening pull, centers to Elijah Long, and quickly Trevor Lynch gets a touch, and now Joe White picked up by Troy Holland. Get your popcorn ready as Jacob Fairfax is going deep, and it's incomplete. And the Breeze have a break chance less than 25 seconds in. I think that's Carolina coming right out and trying to set the tone. Immediately sending it down. They know that they are the superior downfield team. They have the athletes to be able to go up against D.C. And, hey, why not test it on the first point? And the Breeze do nothing with their early break chance. Blood good incomplete. Looking for McDonald in the middle. And White will pick up on the goal line. 
Joe White breaks the mark and hits Anders Jungst for the score. The well, Flyers are number two in the league in hold percentage, and it's not always that they have clean possessions. We see them turn it over here, but their defense after a turnover from the O-line, very good. Deep shot early. Fairfax just hesitates slightly. I mean, really, he's he's open there. If he runs that full speed the whole way, he's going to come down with it. Slight miscommunication, but D.C. goes nowhere with the D-line, and then it's just easy red zone offense for Carolina. What do you say to Troy Holland there on the mark? He did everything he could and yet still got broken mercilessly by Joe uh, White, who can get that throw yeah. off whenever he wants. I know. It's a big field. Oh, can't <laughs> you can't it. cover the whole field okay. if you're the mark. So, I, thought it was, I mean, uh, it, just I put in an know. unfortunate situation there. I don't think... If you're a D-line player, you don't expect to have the disc that quickly into the game. So that might have been some of the issues there. Young 19-year-old Tobias Brooks launches the first pull of the day for Carolina. Saw Yannick charging down defensively. Kevin Pignoni, four days after winning a championship with North Carolina, back in the AUDL lineup for the Flyers, his second appearance of the season. There are a lot of college champions on this Carolina team, both from North Carolina, obviously, but also the Carlton alums like Yannick and Bloodworth and White. And D.C. turns it over on their first possession. Ort looking for Edmonds with the hammer. Well, that's smart. Double team early on Ort. You know, they want to get him open in the deep space. They don't really want to have him being a thrower off the sideline. Ethan Bloodworth resets for Yannick. Terrence Mitchell playing in his 106th AUDL game tonight. And he throws it right to Johnny Mawks, who wins possession back for the Breeze. Good reset pressure from DC against the Dominator. Cole Jurek was questionable coming into the game tonight, but he warmed up and he is good to go. Matched up with Mitchell here. Andrew Roy and Kevin Pignoni, and Mitchell goes for the block, but it finds Jurek anyway. Now downfield, Boxley gets his first touch. Rising backhand, and it's caught by the secondary target, Thomas Edmonds. There is zero wind right now here in Washington, D.C. But the offenses have both started out somewhat shaky. Carolina's flashing the lanes, trying to move the disc laterally and not letting D.C. get into a rhythm. I mean, a couple opportunities for Johnny Malks to take a shot downfield. He's declined both times. Andrew Roy sneaks free. And scores the opening goal for the Breeze. I know it's just the second point of the game, but I think that's a very crucial point when you go back and look at how the flow and the momentum of this game can go. Carolina was able to get the disc, get in the end zone, be right on the doorstep, and with opportunity to maybe call a timeout, sub in your offense. A DC, I mean, they're a team that historically, when they turn it over on offense, they don't have too many playmakers that are going to be able to get the disc back for them. They were able to get fortunate with the miscommunication in the backfield, and then they do exactly what they do best. Patient offense, slowly get down the field, wait for the dam to break, and they were able to punch it in there with the third of Aroy. Tyler, what is your perception of this Breeze offense's risk tolerance? And do, do you feel they need to be more aggressive, or is this their style and they're sticking to it, regardless of what the Flyers' defense is going to do? I think for years it has been their style of what they wanted to do and they I mean they want to be the slow steady offense that it doesn't matter how they do it just get it into the end zone but over the course of the past several seasons especially with New York being one of the teams that they've set as the bar that they have to beat they have to be a little bit more uh, they have to take more chances if you will down the field because New York and company they have the athletes to be able to match up against DC they've been a great hucking team in the past Evan but not so much this year, only 50% on their hucks, and they're going to have to figure out where they want to get those shots. And they're 20th in the league out of 24 teams in huck completion percentage entering the night. Charlie, I think a big reason for that is Rowan McDonald was on the offense. Rowan McDonald was taking probably 70, 80% of the hucks on the team, so when you have such a talented player like that, you need someone to fill that void. Speaking of a huck, it's Long looking for White, and he's got him. Beats Holland over the top. 
And they, they actually rule him not in the end zone. So Joe White got away with a travel, and Matt Gushohannes is going to get credit for the goal. All that did was take an assist away from Elijah Long. Alas, 2-1 Flyers. That's going to be a fun matchup. 91 versus 91. Holland versus White. White coming over to the O-line today. I mean, these are two really good athletes to know how to control their bodies and get it down the field. Uh, if they're the matchup for the entire game, that's going to be a one to watch. Great shape on the throw from Long. Johannes, the recipient of a goal. Hey, Grayson's line. Assist for Grayson's line. Grayson's his Grayson's college Grayson's teammate Long. Will Coffin launching the pull. And here's Jacques Nissen, who was oh so close to ending North Carolina's charge for a three-peat in the quarterfinals early this past Sunday morning. Charlie, you had a front row seat. Brown really performed admirably and just came up slightly short. Ben Ort is airing it out deep. Cole Jurek versus Matt Tucker. Tucker tips it. Jurek catches it. DC scores. Well, we got a fun one tonight. We've had a huck on almost every single offensive point so far. And Ben Ort not afraid to take some shots. You know, he makes the turnover off the sideline, throwing the hammer, but feeling a little bit more comfortable here in rhythm with the backhand. And it's a great effort from Tucker. That's great defense, but unable to haul it down. Let's go down to the sideline with Will Smolinski. You're talking a lot about Ben Ort changing this offense. Are you expecting him to be a deep thrower? Um, I think he brings that dynamic to the game. We saw that in his first game with DC against New York. He was clutch in a way that I think got overlooked. He had a couple really good deep uh, throws that really kind of changed the game and changed the way that New York had to play defense against him. So even though he is kind of a taller player, he's got long legs, he's got really good speed, he does have some of those deep throws. I think that he would say that he wants that one back. Obviously, the outcome is okay, but we're going to see more of that from him, at least to threaten it. That's a good point. I mean, his performance, especially in the second half against New York, changed the game, and uh, Fairfax was ruled out of bounds there, a little casual on the sideline. Yeah, there's a lot of lines on this field, and especially when you go on that far sideline, there's about three lines in a row. It's sometimes difficult to tell which one's in bounds if you aren't familiar with these combines. Will, that happened right in front of you. What'd you see? Yeah, so over on this side of the field, there's a white line that's a sideline, and then there's another red line that's the player line. The reason that's confusing is the sideline that's closest to the camera side is also a red line. It's a break for the breeze after the Flyers' mental error. McDonald for Merrill. And the first lead of the night for DC. Hard to complain too much here if you're the Flyers. I mean, it, it's an unforced error, of course, but it's one that you're not going to be unhappy with if you're the coaching staff. But the Breeze able to take advantage this time. Yeah, and I mean, that's the reason why they brought Rowan over to the D-line this year. Their defensive offense really struggled the last couple of seasons. They just didn't have... The throwers to be able to put the disc in the end zone in different spots. They had good, steady handlers, but sometimes on D-lines, you need those creative guys that can really put the disc in all corners of the field. So that's right there, a scooper there by Rowan to be able to get the first break. And we know how good of a goal scorer Joe Mara can be. I mean, he had 45 goals in the regular season last year, 52 if you include the playoffs. Coming after a top 15 in the league goals performance with the Breeze two years ago. Back with D.C. after a quick season in Utah. White underneath, marked by his fellow number 91, Troy Holland. First touch for Liam Searles Bowes. And he will take the big swing across the field for Trevor Lynch. Lynch has been an underrated key cog for this Flyers offense so far this year. Kind of one of those guys getting more reps, more touches, more opportunities, especially with the absence of Eric Taylor out with an injury. Long looking for Searles Bowes. Fall is chasing, and Liam very casually, routinely finishes the point for the Carolina Flyers. Love the way that Carolina started this possession. They get Jacob Fairfax open in space, and then it's a couple of easy throws to get the offense flowing. 
And you see them not trying to huck too early this time. They were more, work more patient possession. Never really any pressure on any of the throws that they made. Except maybe this one. But when you got LSB back there to the back shoulder, it's a pretty sure thing. If this is your first time checking out the AUDL on YouTube, this is week six of our regular season. These two teams met back in week one on April 29th. You can watch every single AUDL game all year long on AUDL.TV. It's less than 10 bucks a month. There are 13 games in the league this weekend. There are 13 games in the league next weekend. It's less than a dollar per game to watch the highest level of ultimate in the world. Some really good games this weekend. New York and Boston, a couple undefeated teams going head to head in Beantown. Tomorrow we'll see this Flyers team up in Philly in our game of the week that will air on Fox Sports 2 later on this weekend as well. Disc in the hands of the Dutch youngster, Ben Ort, now Jacques Nissen from Andrew Roy. Roy now guarded by Davis in a switch. Yannick's on Nissen. No Johnny Mox this point. No problem so far for DC. Tyler Monroe patiently working it around. Ort to the end zone. Jurek. I want to see the step count for Jacques Nissen at that point. Running sideline to sideline, dictating the offense, really just opening up doors for them, and then he, the team just has to respect Nissen's throwing ability. He's such a talented thrower. He has that creativity that we talk a lot about with Rowan McDonald. But Nissen, I mean, adding him into this D.C. offense might be what the team feels like they've been missing over the first couple of weeks of the season. I think he was the MVP of the college championships this past weekend. Evan, you mentioned Brown almost taking down UNC, and that was a lot because of how great Nissen played in that game. Interesting note about that, he was getting open in the deep space a lot, catching goals downfield. Probably going to see him operating more in the backfield for this Breeze team, but he's dangerous all over the field. And he's just 22 years old, yet it feels like he's been playing the AUDL for a while because he had his debut came less than two weeks after his 18th birthday. They had to wait. They had to wait for him to turn 18. He had already made the team as a high schooler. He was a practice player as a 16, 17-year-old. Daryl Stanley, the head coach of the Breeze, has called him one of the spongiest players he's ever coached in terms of how he absorbs information. Lynch back for Gush Johannes, marked by Bloodgood. And here's Fairfax with Merriman, the former Defensive Player of the Year nearby. Lynch breaks off deep, but Fairfax isn't looking. Instead, it's white underneath. Anders Jungst, hampered by injury a year ago. He has rediscovered his form from a couple years ago. That would have been a foul if it wasn't complete, but we play on. Flyers, certainly their most deliberate possession of the game so far, taking what's available. Carolina winners of three straight after starting 0-2, and, and Searles bows, shot deflected and caught anyway. Trevor Lynch, the goal, Musa Ja, oh so close to the block, and yet it's a score for the Flyers again. It seems like whenever these two teams get together, there's going to be max to either your teammate or the other side. It just happened happen all the time in week one. I counted maybe six or seven, and I might have missed it two. We've already had three max that another player has been able to catch in this game. Yeah, each D-line's got to be thinking, well, we should have had that one free score for each team and uh, throw into coverage. No question. Tucker got the block and was caught by Jurek on Ort's deep shot. There's Mike Denardis, who's been coaching the Flyers since their first season, 2015. Flyers went to the championship weekend in their first year and then got back for the first time in 2021 when they won the championship. Denardis was named AUDL Coach of the Year. This is a franchise that all time is 81 and 28. It's not bad. 
and that championship was here in D.C. over at D.C. United Saudi Field. Alex Davis looking like the intended target against Boxley, and Boxley almost got the deflection, but it will be a block for A.D. Well, that's going to be a lot of fun. Davis on Boxley. Davis wins round one. I don't think Davis is going to be the only one covering Boxley today. I think it's going to be a combined effort, throw different looks at him. Yannick looking long, Pignoni going deep on Roy. Pignoni's got it. Shy of the goal line, still work to do. Reset for Brooks, a touch for Bloodworth. Back to Brooks. Closing in on two minutes to play in this opening quarter. And the Flyers have broken back to retake the lead. Ethan Bloodworth had a scary moment last week in their game against Houston. Went down, was holding his knee. He said it was no big deal. He was fine. Here's the D that set it up. Uh, David should know to catch that one after what we've seen so far in this game. Serious. He gets away with it. And then really crisp offense from the D-line. Great work between the handlers. And I think, you know, talking to Mike Denardis before the game, they want DC to huck. They want to have those one-on-one -on -one battles. They feel like they can win those regularly, and it's going to give them the opportunity to go march down and get a break. Charlie, we've gotten used to seeing Saul Gannick quarterback this O-line for the Flyers the last couple of years to the, the semis and to win a championship, but... I mean, his origin story is a D-line heartbeat type guy, and if he can be the engine of this D-line, that's a different dynamic than we've seen recently for this Carolina team. His natural place on the field is on the D-line. I mean, that's, that's who he is. He's an incredible defender, and then obviously he gives you great offense. The only reason they moved him to the O-line is because his offense was so good, they felt that they had to. It's true. Thomas Edmonds. Looking end zone, Johnny Malks is there. I feel the addition of Thomas Edmonds to this team this year was one of the underrated storylines. There was a lot of hypo and player movement this year, and of course Cole Yurick and Ben Ort coming over to D.C. But, I mean, Edmonds is a player that you don't know what you're going to get when he has the disc in his hands. He can put it into different spots. He sees the field very well. And he's also a very talented cutter that's able to get the disc a lot. And their integration of trying to get him into the focal point of this offense this year is, I think, where the team ascend or wants to ascend to be at the end um, of the year is having Boxley and Edmonds just kind of being the dual threats. Through 10 points, the numbers are scary identical. The Flyers are 65 of 68 passing. The Breeze are 66 of 69. Each team's one for two on break chances. Each team has one block. Each team has three turns. Each O-line is four for six. I mean, it is eerie how close this has been in the first quarter. But it feels dead even, doesn't it? It sure does. It's not a surprise to see the numbers match the eye test. Long at midfield, swings it for Gusho Hannes. And Fairfax. And I think both D lines have actually played pretty good downfield defense today. I mean, really, the movement has come on the swings to the opposite sides of the field, which, when you play on an AUDL size field, you can't stop. It feels like there have been more blocks than just the one per side, but a couple blocks have been caught by the offense, so those don't become official stats. And we get a stoppage, which will halt the clock. Officials confer 37 seconds on our stadium scoreboard here at Carlini Field. Flyers played here back-to-back -back weeks in 2021. Lost a double OT heartbreaker and then got their scrumptious revenge in the playoffs a couple weeks later. White squeezes it through for Long. And it's a Flyers goal with 23 seconds left in the half. In the first quarter, excuse me. White's break throwing has been very good so far in the game. And watching him warm up, he was, he was specifically working on break throws. I saw him throwing more inside forehands than inside backhands. But that one, he catches in rhythm and then boom, 
explodes through the mark. No chance to stop that one with his length. Yeah, when you have that element of your game, it, it opens up so many doors for your offense. Did Carolina score too soon? Well, 25 seconds is a lot of time, although we've seen the Flyers' D-line able to keep D.C. having to work a lot through their handlers. 25, though, that's definitely an opportunity for Brees. If the pull's inbound, offenses have to go 20 yards further at the end of quarters and every possession this year than they did last year. Monks gets it out of the end zone to Monroe. Middle of the field, Edmonds. And Malx has it. 15 seconds in the quarter. Across midfield for Jurek. Malx shooting it over the zone. Fairfax picks it off, and the Flyers have time. Yannick to beat the buzzer. Length of the field. Terrence Mitchell giving chase. As the buzzer sounds, it's tipped, and it's incomplete. And Johnny Malx. Shaken up on the play. Mitchell expressing his concern. Good thing we just heard Johnny say, I think I'm fine. Hopefully that is the case. A few more likable guys in the league than Johnny Malks. It's a lot of bodies. Uh, what, what a nice job by the Flyers' D-line to give themselves an opportunity to try to get one here. And... You see Mitchell just, just catching a little extra. Mitchell little just knee. tumbled over him accidentally. Good to see Johnny trotting off the field. At end of quarter stand, something to remember as we go deeper into this game. One down, three to go on Friday night Frisbee. And it's free on YouTube. Flyers up 6-5. What do you think, son? Eight or nine. For that, I'd use this. Manscaped, huh? Son, back in my day, ladies love grass in the fairways. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not for down there. The Beard Hedger's for your face. Oh, really? The Beard Hedger features a rotary zoom wheel that provides 20 precision settings with just one guard. Grip it and trim it, baby. Introducing the Beard Hedger. Order today at manscaped.com. you want to be a champion. Of course you want to be working towards winning titles. Be happy but never satisfied. Better than ever. Second quarter action about to get going here at Carlini Field, but first the DC Breeze would like to thank Domino's Pizza, who has been the world's leader in pizza delivery since 1960. And Frank Meats made sure that the Washington DC metropolitan area will get a taste of the Domino's experience. Founded in 1983, Team Washington Inc. has involved, evolved into one of the best Domino's Pizza franchises and is globally recognized for great service, great teamwork, and great food. We had some before the game, and I'm still hungry because it was delicious. Breeze trailing 6-5 after one. Let's check back in with our sideline analyst, Will Smolinski. Curious to get your first quarter thoughts, Will, on the chess match that has begun tonight between these two familiar foes. I hope everybody's enjoying the Boxley and Alex Davis matchup. Um, it's been interesting to watch, especially, you know, they match up so well. Um, you know, Boxley more of the agility guy, Alex Davis more of the um, straight, straight running guy. And so... Talking to Saul Yannick before the game was really interesting. I was asking about their subbing system because they're going away from kind of a classic O-line, D-line system to one where 
guys can kind of play both ways. And one of the things he brought up is like it allows Alex Davis to also play defense. So when you play against somebody like Christian Boxley, he's not sitting on the sideline watching. He can have a big impact on whatever the biggest offensive weapon is on the other team. Yeah, Alex Davis scored 57 goals last year, third in the league. He hasn't scored a lot this year, just four goals in three games, but had the first quarter block. That really is the difference in the game. Led to the Flyers' only break. This feels like a, a vintage Flyers-Breeze matchup, doesn't it? These are two full-strength teams. There's always a shift in the AUDL season after college nationals when the teams kind of become whole. And it isn't to say that key players from both sides aren't missing. If you talk about David Cranston and Jasper Tom and Eric Taylor obviously hurt for the Flyers, but th this is a, a heavyweight duel tonight. You go back to 2021 when these two teams were in the same division and they played two one-goal games. Bobbled and dropped by Wodach on the tough contest from Brooks. Now Brooks coming under. Goes with a hammer. Alex Davis has his first goal of the night. And the Flyers have a two-goal lead. I think we need to remember that this Flyers team, after a slow start, has been very good. They've beaten Austin. They've beaten Atlanta. They've looked like the much better team in those games. And so this is not the same Flyers team that we saw early on. And nice pressure from Brooks. Very talented senior in high school. He's going to be leading his Jordan high school team at the high school national invite in a couple of weeks. And coming up with the assist and the block. I guess everything about Alex Davis is fast. Getting those hands up to get ready for that, that hammer, that one's coming in like a laser. What are the other uh, headlines for the high school national invite? What other young players are you most excited to see? Oh my gosh, I, I, the, the, the great thing about it is that you learn about these players. Oftentimes for the first time, uh, there's some very talented players on the West Coast who I'm looking forward to seeing. Any guys in this game tonight, you first see him at the high school national invite? I'm gonna have to go through uh, the, the rosters, but almost certainly Nissen, was an incredibly talented high school. I don't remember if I saw him at YCC's or at HSNI first, but he was at both. He and A.J. Merriman, teammates at YCC's, along with, I believe, Matt McKnight, who's inactive tonight for the Flyers, but we expect him to play tomorrow in Philly. Davis coming under and almost had his second D. Instead, it's Wodach resetting for Roy. Ort marked by Tucker. Two long, lanky dudes. And speaking of long and lanky, here's Nissen. Seems to get taller every time you watch him play. And he has pinpoint precision on his throws. It's precision with his throws, but it's also incredible 360 degree vision with which he plays. He sees the field really well. He, he's, just, he's just another weapon. And I mean, I talked about two, three points ago, just him running all down the field. I mean, he's cutting deep. He's going underneath. He's not getting the disc, but he's just that workhorse that just continues to turn that you see Carolina trading off him every single time that they can. But again, just the ability that he's able to see the field and see where people are and just finding Wodach just slowly creeping towards the back line and putting in a spot where he over the entire defense. What a backfield this Breeze team right, is going to have by the one, end of the year. You know, this is Nissen's first game, already looking polished and ready to go, and alongside Andrew Roy, no turnovers tonight. I mean, those two guys, along with Johnny Malks, they could be very tough to deal with in playoffs. And when he came back this week, all the players are super excited to have him back, and they said the transition to getting him back into the O-line was seamless. I mean, he's, he's been on this team now for what? Uh, three years, four years, when you count when he was on the practice squad, so. A pick away from the throw, and this one's coming back. Alex Crew talking about Nissen's performance in practice and said, yeah, like, he fit back in seamlessly, and his defense after a turn was really high level. And obviously, you train to be in your best of shape to play college nationals. 
He's not getting up to speed in the AUDL. He is at full speed as he arrives. What? Tumbling behind the play, and Bloodgood calls a foul on himself for the accidental bump into Gush Hannes. Two spirited dudes, competitive, battling with one another in the backfield. Joe White looking deep. Elijah Long has steps on Rafis, who's making up the ground. And Rafis got there first. Holy cow. That looks money out of the hands of Joe White. But Rafis closed about 15 yards of space to make the play. He was an All-American college sprinter. And you saw it right there. And Rafis is one of those guys that can get this team fired up. He, he brings the energy. He's like, he's like an AJ. He's like a fall. He can really get this team fired up. McDonald looking for fall testing Fairfax. And it's denied by Jake Fairfax as the Flyers get possession back. That's not the guy to test on well, Carolina. Who is the guy to test? <laughs> well, that's a good question. We've seen their big... Big playmakers coming up with those one-on-ones. So the second offensive possession of the point for Carolina. Fairfax picks up his fourth block of the season. That's actually his fifth because he intercepted the deep pass in the closing seconds of the first. Two blocks in the half for Fairfax. Liam Searles bows, unmarked for the moment. Now Ja sets the count. Blading backhand for Joe White. And Carolina's back up by two. Let's quickly check in with Will on the sidelines for an update on Johnny Mox. Will. Yeah, I knew we were a little bit worried at first, and then he, we kind of heard him on the mic say he's all right. I asked him over here on the sidelines right next to me, hey, John, you okay? And he flashed me that Johnny Mox smile <laughs> and just said, yeah, man, I'm good. That is excellent to hear. Charlie, what a wild point that was. Grinding. I, you know, great defense from the Breeze. Smart poaching by Jaw there in the in the lane, but Joe White able to sneak to the back of the end zone. That has to be a precise throw, and it gets there right on target. I think both these teams are really performing at a high level right now. I mean, we've already talked about the defense, and both both sides have really done such a great job of containing the middle section of the field. The five to 20 yards uh, spot where teams love to attack to be able to get that flow and both sides are really just cutting it off forcing them to handle the resets and also just giving away the downfield options which neither of these teams are shown to have success with right now oh my goodness roy lays out to keep possession alive after a tremendous pull really forced dc to do a lot of work in its own end zone Jurek continues for Wodach. Coffin sets the mark and Wodach breaks him. Malks double teamed. Wodach is wide open, but Johnny needs help. And that is contact on the mark. Thought it was going to be a stall, but it's a foul against the Flyers instead. Johnny turned around ready to protest, but he actually got the whistle. Great opportunistic double team there. Not a lot of open unders for either team. Midway through the second quarter. Boxley to Roy. Back to Boxley being chased by Yuan. And Boxley with an air bounce backhand. Perfectly placed for Thomas Edmonds. Breeze within one. Well, Breeze got bailed out there with the with the whistle. I mean, it was about one second away from being a stall. And a lot of times you see a little contact go uncalled in those double team situations. Nice save from Aroy. And then this strike cut motion was much more effective than trying to get the cutters activated on the unders and smooth score for the Breeze after the stoppage. 
those are both guys that you traditionally see in the backfield making those strikes, getting getting so open that there, it doesn't even look like the guy that is covering them is actually going up against him. Boxley had five, ten yards on his guy. Edmonds had five, ten yards on his guy. And when they're able to kind of just break through, they're just flowing. Couple nice saves for Andrew Roy on that point. He's leading the breeze with 185 throwing yards, 25 for 25 passing. Elijah Long is the game's leader in throwing and total yards right now for this Carolina offense. Joe White is not far behind. Gained some more yards to Lynch, who finds Youngst. Youngst and Rafus have had some battles through the years. Merriman going to be called for interference, which will set up Fairfax on the goal line. He was within 10 yards of the end zone, so he will center the disc on the front edge of the end zone. Merriman coming off a great game in Toronto. Now he had four blocks. It was a career high. Musa Ja also had four blocks as the Breeze defense had their way with a rush. Fairfax resets for Kusho Hannes. White plays catch with Gooch. These quick throws are really tough to guard. And White finds Gooch Johanna sneaking through for the score. Two-man game. Uh, two of the best in the business at working it in the backfield in small spaces in the red zone. I, there's almost nothing you can do as a Breeze defender. Especially at this level of the game, at the AUDL field. I mean, if you are half a step, half a step back, there's no way you can catch up with the speed of these athletes. Late bid there. Good call from the refs. I don't know how Joe White will feel about this, but there's something dark sidey about what we just saw from that end zone offense. Just seemingly unstoppable. Taking their own space, making the smart throw, and executing to perfection. And, and these are these are good stat numbers for Magda Johannes, if you can believe it. Negative oh. yardage. That's okay. That's his job. He led the league in negative receiving yards last year. He finished with minus 397. That was a, a 196 yards fewer than Detroit's David Innes, who was second in negative receiving yards in the league. Monroe chased by Mataraju, and that's well placed. 9-8 is our score as Ty Monroe gets his first goal of the day. You talk about negative yardage. Uh, Tyler Monroe, a coach of a high school team in the area, Yorktown High School, he's one that would love to have more of his guys on the field have negative yardage and being able to get the disc to his uh, handlers on his team. That's the first fast O point we've seen in quite some time in this game. The two vets, too. Wodach to Taimon. First assist of the night for Wodach. His fourth of the year. Playing in his 71st career game. Darrell looks like he's in a pretty good mood. When his offense holds that effortlessly, that cheers a coach up. Flyers still up one. Under five minutes to play in this first half. What a great half of ultimate we've seen here. Yeah, it's been really high level, really intense. You know, testy, but pretty clean, competitive, fair. And uh, the outcome very much in doubt right now. And why does this game matter so much? Well, both these teams are battling for position in their respective divisions, DC in the east. Carolina in the south and there are other quality teams in both their divisions that have these teams in third place right now I mean Austin in Atlanta in the south obviously New York and Boston doing battle tonight once the lightning delay subsides up in the northeast I think both teams with a loss are going to find it to be a pretty uphill battle to get the one seed in their division and get the home playoff game to go to championship weekend. I think they both have a very similar mentality. I think they both think they are good enough to make the playoff field and they have to worry about 
the other teams in the division. Obviously, they have to win the games, but the loss will take them away from the number one seed, and that goes on both sides of it, just the way the results have played out. Bloodgood was a fraction of an inch away from a spectacular block, but he comes up empty, and Joe White has his second goal of the game for the Flyers. At yeah, that point, you saw Charlie McCutcheon right there in front of the Carolina Flyers sideline, a former Flyers member from last year, and he's the guy that has a scouting report on every single player on this team. I mean, I've saw, I've seen this year, uh, he and Aroy and other players in the Breeze, where they get together, and then a Breeze player's like, hey, how about Coffin? What's he like? And then Charlie just like, encyclopedia, like what he does well, what he struggles with, and he just thinks of the game at such a high level and you know he loves to get into it and chatter with those guys when they're able to meet off. Joe White now two goals, four assists, leading the game in yardage with 354 yards. It's been excellent. He had an incomplete throw on his first pass of the first point and he's completed 22 straight since then. See, the Flyers' downfield defenders are really trying to do a good job in the unders. Boxley gets free here, but they're really trying to put pressure on this D.C. offense. And Tucker is there. Gets a piece of it. Flyers quickly countering. Hammer, Tucker, denied by Jurek. I am shocked Mike Denard does not call a timeout there. He has two in his pocket for this half. Two minutes left, trying to get another break to really just stamp the lead. Now, there's really no reason for him to save the timeout here. Or to force that hammer. I mean, it looked like they were off to the races and just threw up that hanger. Gave Jurek a chance. And that would have given Carolina a three-goal lead. And now Malk's floating it deep. Monroe has plenty of time, takes a look back, does not land in. Monroe will get the assist if Orton makes the catch, and that's no problem for the Dutch phenom. Ben Orton brings the breeze within one, just seconds after it looked like the Flyers were going to stretch the lead to three. After that hug, Johnny Malks was not concerned about his team scoring. After he threw it, he just walked straight to the sideline. Whole time, he didn't even look to push down when he saw Tyler Monroe was short. He just walked straight to the sideline. Knew they were able to be able to punch it in. Will they give him a hard time for warning the warning track, track power? power. <laughs> yeah, I think they will. I mean, I, you know, it's fine to throw it a little bit short, but if you're going to walk off the field, you better make sure it's in. That was the first red zone turnover of the game that we just saw from Carolina. Yep, they were seven for seven before that mistake. Each team turning at one time on that point. Flyers are now two for five on break chances. The Breeze are one for three. 20 goals, uh, excuse me, uh, 19 goals and 13 turnovers combined so far in this game. See how the Flyers handle the sideline trap. Ray Fiss, full extension, heroic stuff. And he was baiting the throw and it just went right for him. He couldn't even believe it. Timeout, Daryl Stanley. Rafis, as great of an energy impact defender as anyone in this league. And with a minute to play in the half, the Breeze on the brink of tying this thing up at 10. Carolina, come on Carolina, no, none of that, none of that. You know, D.C. historically playing defense, they've never been one that have been a huge tactical schematic team. They don't do things that are complex schemes and try and force things and opportunities. They just want to play good defense. This season, we're seeing it a little bit more of the roller pulls that go out of bound and setting up the double team. The trapping and putting guys in different opportunities to go make and get D's. This season, I think having that extra element could be the edge that gets them over the top. We but typically think of Skies as posters, but check out that poster. That was awesome. And, and you know, a lot of times you see teams give up the super deep reset for free, but they put Rafus back there to put some pressure on that throw, and then there's nowhere to go with it off the line, so they have to try to swing it back, and Rafus monster layout. Chance to tie it up here for the Breeze. 
Malks guarded by Yannick. About 10 yards away from the corner of the end zone on the sideline. Boxley and Davis getting ready to duel on the brink of the end zone. And swing for Nissen. Continue Boxley. This looks like a dominator with those three. But now Malks retreats for the end zone. Monroe makes himself free at the front of the stack. Malks misplayed slightly by Fairfax. Allowed Johnny to swing it. And Ort is the finisher. On the quick dish from Edmonds, we're tied, 10 all. I mean, that's why they're the number one in zone team in the league. They are just so patient. They are perfectly content to lose yards, to swing the disc to the other side. No one on this O-line wants to force the disc down into the end zone. They just wait for the opportunity to present itself. And that's exactly what this one did. I mean, what, they were maybe seven, eight yards away, and it took them 20 throws to get in the end zone? They don't care. It's a little greedy from Jacob Fairfax there, blowing by. You can't do that against a player as good as Malks unless you're 80 percent sure you're going to get the block. He wasn't even close, and then it made it an easy swing around onto the break side into the end zone. Second break of the night for the Breeze. Each team has eight holds and two breaks, and we are deadlocked with 39 seconds left in the half. Blood good to pull, and he will skip it across the sideline. And D.C. will set the double team. Merrill and Fall. The double team long on the first throw. And he'll hammer across for Lynch. Flyers do not need to hurry. They got plenty of time. White, tight space. But Long quickly gets rid of it for Kusho Hannes. Searles Bowes is all alone on the far side of the field. Now Bloodgood. Fades over there defensively. We're down to 16 seconds. White, a quick pivot. Finding the quickest guy in a phone booth you could ever imagine. Anders Jungst puts the Flyers back up one with under 10 seconds to play. And why is it so hard to guard that at the front cone for Jungst? Obviously, he is very shifty he is very fast but it's also because joe white has the disc in his hands and you can't trust the mark to hold the break side for you so when you stops on a dime right there defender has to respect that lane and then you're able to get open at the cone and the timing on that score couldn't have been more perfect seven seconds left eight seconds on the stadium clock uh, dc will have couple opportunities to get the disc down towards midfield before they get the shot off but man that was that was perfect timing for Carolina to try and make sure they have a lead going into the halftime break. Jacob Fairfax is just hanging out on the Flyers goal line as a deep deep safety. Nissen with eight seconds to Malks with six he gets rid of it and gains a good amount of yards for McDonald. Three seconds airing this one up. The 50-50 is going to be shy of the goal line. It's tipped and caught, but a yard short of the goal line. And that is how the half will end. Nissen squeezed it when, in retrospect, he should have macked it. And the Breeze will be down one as we reach half. Double Mac is hard. Yes, yes the double is. Mac is hard. What a half of ultimate, gentlemen. Amazing. Five and five here in the second quarter. And even on breaks, I, I don't know what more you want. I mean, we've got high flying action, hucks, blocks, a little bit of everything, and maybe the maybe the best game I've seen so far this season in the AUDL through one. Joe White, five assists, two goals, involved in seven of the Flyers' 11 first half scores. I'd say the move on to O-line worked out okay. It looks like we got the coach of the Flyers. Mike Denardis, do you think uh, Joe White earned an opportunity to play offense a little bit more in the second half, Mike? Yeah, I mean, the guy's super talented, and when we use him as a facilitator, like he's been playing, you know, like he's been playing, like he, he's amazing, and, and you know, this is exactly what we asked for, so uh, we're getting it. Do you sense that the level of intensity and just the overall level of play is up a couple notches from where this these two teams were five weeks ago? Yeah, I mean, the first half was kind of a slog. It felt like people were getting adjusted, maybe because it's a little hot tonight. But, uh, I mean, you see, I think the offense is a little bit better. We're not as clean on breaks as we can be. But the, the main thing is offense. Offense looks better for both teams. So 
kind of knew that coming in. It's just the, you know, capitalizing on the opportunities, especially the ones we got early, uh, we got to do in the second half. Did you like the, what your D-line was able to do winning some of those 50-50 balls, especially on the Hawks from, D, uh, from uh, D.C.? Yeah. I mean, we, we know we're, we're, we are super athletic, and that's stuff we can do if, if everything doesn't get thrown perfectly. And, uh, you know, it's great to see that and, and exert our, you know, athleticism on them. Uh, I would like them to be a little more perfect on offense, but uh, defensively it's nice. I mean, you know, we had a couple more opportunities that we swatted at and missed, and, and AD had one that he ran too fast for to get the D. So, um, you know, I think we'll have more of those opportunities, and hopefully we capitalize on more on D. Mike, you were able to get a turnover here in the final two minutes in your attacking third of the field, but you, you held on to that timeout. What was going through your head on whether to not to – to execute uh, that. <laughs> I was trying to take a timeout. Uh, the, the, the ref is 60 yards down the field. We share a sideline. It's impossible to get there. Uh, we turned it, and I was sprinting, and I got about 20 yards away from him when we turned it. So I was definitely trying to take a turnback timeout there. So Alex Davis is too fast and you're too slow? Is yeah, that what you're saying? well, a couple extra LBs these days, you know. Mike, thanks for the time. Best of luck going forward. Thanks. Mike Denardis, 2021 AUDL Coach of the Year for the champion Carolina Flyers. They beat the Breeze en route to that title that they won here in Washington, D.C. Another epic chapter between these two rivals unfolding tonight at the half. It's Carolina 11, D.C. 10, here on AUDL.TV and YouTube. Free Friday Frisbee rolls on. July from Nottingham, England, the World Flying Disc Federation's World Under 24 Ultimate Championships. Live all access coverage, including semis and finals, exclusively at ultiworld.com. Responsible business is now sort of uh, an essential facet of the future economy. Like, I'm talking like every business needs to start thinking about their social and, and especially environmental impact. And if we look at all the problems that we have in the world today, they're not going to be solved by our governments and the not-for-profits. I think business has a really big role to kind of play. B Corp really kind of helps companies through the certification really understand that and kind of dig into their impact further. What do you think, son? Eight or nine? For that, I'd use this. Manscaped, huh? Son, back in my day, ladies loved grass in the fairways. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not for down there. The beard hedger is for your face. Oh, really? The beard hedger features a rotary zoom wheel that provides 20 precision settings with just one guard. Grip it and trim it, baby. Introducing the beard hedger. Order today at manscaped.com. you want to be a champion of course you want to be working toward winning titles be happy but never satisfied better than ever Tremendously entertaining first half of Ultimate tonight in Washington, D.C. It's the Flyers in front, 11 to 10. And let's toss it down to our sideline analyst, Will Smolinski. Will, you've been a coach in this league. 
What first half adjustments would you be thinking about at halftime here for each side? I think the defensive adjustments for Raleigh has been coming right on time. So as soon as they need, you know, a little bit more pressure or a couple break opportunities to come out of switching out of, you know, straight up person to person defense or going into like the trap zone. So if I were Carolina, I would really think, think about like, how do we adjust that? So it's still a surprise. We've seen pretty much all of the tricks they have in the bag, but the sequence they come in does matter. Uh, for DC, I think offensively, they need to start opening up the game a little bit more. There's been a couple times where they have somebody open deep, like Christian Boxley or even Edmonds cutting deep, but it's get it's getting looked up, looked off, and that's why a lot of the undercuts are covered. Is because Raleigh's basically like you're not going to throw it, so why would we cover it? Interestingly enough, uh, out of the hucks that we've seen, Wodach has one of those. That's something new that he's kind of added into his game a little bit this year. Uh, as one of the uh, older players, kind of losing some of his speed, I think he's actually done a really good job of being able to open up other players downfield with his throws, which is something that was really missing in other seasons from him. Does the game feel as even from the sideline as it does from the booth? Absolutely. I mean, there's the David Bloodgood almost D over here. The Joe White catch, which you couldn't see because of the camera angle, was even better. Like, Bloodgood got the disc, it's fluttering, and watching Joe White just kind of wash it in his hands very calmly, just look up field and make the next pass was incredible to see. It, the margins are very, very small. That's well said. Will Smolinski down on the sideline, former coach of the Breeze, AUDL.TV analyst for D.C. And we are great to bring you this mega cast tonight on the AUDL.TV and YouTube with the voice of the Breeze, Tyler Byram, and the editor of Ulti World, Charlie Eisenhood. I'm Evan Lepler. Tyler, in many ways, it feels just like another titanic battle between these two powerhouse teams that are both chasing New York and yet they got to beat one another first to get to New York, it feels like, although I guess it's D.C. that really needs to take care of New York to get to the Final Four. Yeah, the, the first quarter of each game is always a feeling out period. But while these two teams were feeling each other out, the level of intensity and the chances that they were taking didn't go down at all. They were playing at a high level, taking those chances that they had. And sometimes D.C., they weren't able to convert on them. Happened on the same side all for Carolina. But... These two teams, I think, are hitting their midseason strides right now, and it's just created a beautiful ultimate match with them both meeting at the same time. Charlie, we saw New York and D.C. a few weeks ago, and the D.C. offense has kind of had its ups and downs. What, what did you think of the Breeze offense in the first half? Well, I, I thought what Will just said made a lot of sense to me, which is that we need to see their shooters be willing to shoot it a little bit more. I think we've seen some reluctance from Johnny Malks to take open shots, Partly, I think, because of what we saw from them so far this season where they haven't been hitting as much as they'd like. But when they've taken the shots tonight, most of the time they've been good ideas. A couple times they hang them up there. We've seen Raleigh make a play. But if they're not going to be able to get the offense they want if they're not willing to take the shots when they're there. All righty. We're at halftime with Carolina in front. 11-10 over D.C. Quick timeout. And then we'll have a chat with Daryl Stanley, hopefully, and then start the third quarter. Important result on the line tonight here on Asian's Capital. Stay with us. Second half moments away, but first we're joined by the head coach of the D.C. Breeze, Daryl Stanley. Uh, Daryl, feels like another exciting chapter between two great teams. What are your thoughts on the first couple quarters? Oh, man. I mean, it's a battle of patience, right? Like, I, I remember a couple weeks ago we were talking, and I, I was talking about, hey, which O-line wants to try to get a hold here? I mean, right now it's just it's hold fest. No wind. Offenses are cruising. We've got to change that up. What, what, when you take a look at what your defense is doing, you know, you're creating pressure for this Carolina team and it's not necessarily always smooth sailing out there 
What is it going to take to dial up some more of the plays like we saw from Luke Rafus on the sideline with the double team trap? Well, I mean, you know, it's great because we've gotten a couple in person too, right? Like I know that was a, a nice little uh, gimmick, so to speak. But I, I, you start to see us like crank up and get those blocks or get close to those blocks. We've gotten three, I think, tipped discs that have been caught anyway. So like, hey, I'm, I'm going to take that. I think that pressure's there. Like you said, we're just systematically working our way through and see like, hey, what's your pathway to success? I'll take that away next. Daryl, I know you guys have wanted to open up the offense a little bit more and trying to get the disc down the field on your huck opportunities. What did you like from the first half or your chances that you took? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we've, we've definitely been working on that. Uh, I'm glad that you've, uh, you've heard. <laughs> I, I really think that when we throw out in the space, we look our best. If we try to like fit it in against uh, these guys, we don't, we don't have Matt Tucker, right? We don't have a guy who's like 6'4 and plus change height. So we got to be a little bit more like you know strategic, and I think you're seeing that with how Tyler's getting uh, getting a lot of looks. I mean, people are so used to fronting him; it's great to see him get back in that space and show them that he's a two-way threat. Last thing, real quick, what do you think is going to decide this game tonight here in the second half? Ooh, I think just like in the fourth quarter, it's going to be who's got that last surge of run, and you know I don't think either team has really showed that surge yet. So let's hope that it's the first and the last. <laughs> it's fun to watch. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks for the time, Daryl. Thank you. Perfect timing. Second half underway as Rowan McDonald unleashes the pull and he launched it a yard too far. Matt Gushohannis judged it well, let it sail out the back and that's a 40 yard difference in field position as this second half gets underway. The Flyers are three and two, the Breeze are three and one. Both teams have a bunch of difficult games ahead. Carolina plays at Philly tomorrow and then goes to Texas next week for matchups with Houston and Austin. D.C. begins June with the Flyers. They will end June with a trip to New York and a rematch of their, against their big rival that they lost to in overtime. Joe Merrill, the block, on the reset looking for Youngst. D.C. with the first break chance here in the second half. Up the line, Gusho Hannes peeled off perfectly for the interception block. One of the smartest players on this Carolina team. So good to get that poach block. Yeah, there are so many times that when you see DC getting that flow, just strike after strike after strike, he noticed he definitely came off knowing that, knowing that was going to happen. White chased by McDonald. Gusho Hannes downfield. Looking long. You don't see Gusho Hannes huck very often, but White takes care of it. Still work to do. Scuba, Fairfax, money in the bank. Joe White is putting a stamp on this game. Working in the backfield with Gusho Hannes, then releasing and having enough steps that Gooch says, all right, I'll put it up to Joe White, one of the best deeps on our team. And then delivering the beautiful scuba to finish the possession. Brilliant, it was a turnover. A little bit of a lazy reset. And then so smart from Gooch Johannes and Joe White is just a menace in the red zone. Five assists. Already for White, plus six on the day. I think he likes playing offense. Uh, yeah. And what a point for Gusho Hannes. I mean, this game is tied, if not for his timing. Everywhere you look, there's an interesting matchup out there on the field. Yannick is going to pick up Johnny Malks, it looks like, with Bloodworth on Roy. That could be reversed. Yep, Yannick's going to chase Roy. Oh, they're both going to be on Malks at the start of the point. Pignoni on Neeson downfield. Mataraju on Monroe. Brooks and Wodach. Mitchell and Jurek. Alex Davis marking Ben Ort. And with a stall count rising, Roy just fires up a prayer, and it's tipped, and it's incomplete. There were no good looks there for D.C. offensively. I mean, credit to Carolina, but, I mean, they kept cutting to the break side there for Roy, so he had no chance. Timeout, Carolina. 
Mike Denardis did not want to wait too long again. And I see your facial expression, Charlie, as if it's to say it's a little early for a timeout in the second half. I mean, I think the way the margins have been in this game, you want to take advantage of the chances that you get. You don't know how many takeaways you're going to get from the offense. It wasn't that many in the first half, so we know we heard from Denardis that he was trying to get the timeout in at the end of the first half and going to look to punch in and take their largest lead of the game here. Hey, take a look, a couple of college champions in the crowd tonight. How about that? Alex Barnett wearing a rhino hat. Finished second in the Callahan voting, but she got the trophy that she most preferred to win, that's for sure. Rooting on their fellow North Carolinians. Best women's college ultimate team of the Ulti World era, Charlie? Yes. I'm, I'm prepared to say that. Yes, they were unbelievable this season. Out of the timeout, Lynch gains some yards, and Joe White gets free. And it's that easy for the Flyers, who have their largest lead of the night, three minutes into the third. Yeah, I mean, that took that could courage from Mike Denardis to call that timeout. Again, two minutes into the half, putting his O-line back out there that had played a long point just before that to try and punch in a hold. But then his O-line shows the reason why that he trusts them to be able to come out there and just get it in. Two, th what, two, three throws? That's all it took for them to go half the field. And the numbers for Joe White are fantastic. I mean, 317 receiving yards, almost 500 total yards of offense. He's got a pair of goals, six assists. Make it three goals. That was his third. Yeah, he he's really playing well. Looks a lot more comfortable than he did in week one with his team. Arguably the most important possession of the night for DC right here. After getting broken on their first O point, you wanted to see a Johnny Maul tuck, and that's why you wanted to see it. Although another warning track shot, Jurek pivoting, pirouettes and finds Monroe. And Yoni comes with a double team. Back for Nissen. Monroe, end zone. Malx. Got it. Malx took his time getting down the field this time. But able to continue the point out all the way there to the end zone. He, he wanted to walk to the sideline. But I think he recognized he needed to do a little bit more here for his team. And he was the one able to get the score. But again, just you can see the patience. You can see there are opportunities to try and thread the needle and push a throw that maybe advanced throwers would be able to hit, but that's not DC's mantra. That's not what they do when they're so close to the end zone. They just slowly, methodically break you down and are able to get someone open in the end zone. So the breeze back within two. By the way, in the battle of undefeated teams in the East Division, New York and Boston tonight, that game is supposed to start a little over an hour ago, but still delayed due to lightning. Most recently projected to be an 8.45 start time as the Flyers turn it over in their own end zone. That might have just been a stone-cold drop from Elijah Long. Well, it was the pressure. The defense is right there on top of you. There's not a lot of room to work with. You know you have to toe the line. You don't know if you're inbounds or out of bounds. I mean, look at all the lines you see right there. Tough decision here for Daryl Stanley because you don't want to use a timeout, but you do want to make sure you get this break. I think trailing, you don't take it unless things look way off. Rafus unmarked for a split second, and they were on the goal line. Now they're back more than halfway to midfield. I think they got maybe two or three more throws to see some positive yardage, otherwise he's going to call it. A.J. Merriman, maybe he'll get involved and make something positive happen. Looking up the line, Alex Fall elevates and scores! That's a big play. That just looked like it might be too tall. But Fall goes up to get it, and D.C. back within one. And the pull just set that one up. I mean, you can just see. I mean, he knew that he was being pressured. There was a guy on his back, and just uh, a silly drop 
that you can't have at this level. Maybe thinking about the next pass, kind of trying to get it out of your own end zone. Alexandre Fall, really springy athlete out of the University of Virginia. And the assist from A.J. Merriman, who is too talented not to be a factor in a possession like that. Well, I think he recognized that they weren't getting anything going, and he saw an opportunity to, to put up a shot and just low enough for Fall to bring it down. Same line for DC staying out there. Didn't have to run very far. Pole landing just shy of the goal line, but it floated for a long time. Junk set from DC. AJ Merriman's the deep deep. The wind was doing nothing earlier. That is not the case now. It's doing something. DC did this in their Toronto game. It's a forced middle action where it's flat when they're in the middle of the field, but when you get to the 25% the side of the field on either side, that's when they try and force it back into the middle, and it really cuts off downfield cuts, and all you're allowed to do is just swing the disc back and forth, hope you get a continuation. Ludgood went flying by again. He doesn't have a block yet, but he's got impressive hang time. White underneath. Davis to Lynch. Joe White lost his headband, but he plays on. Absorbs the bump. Youngst holsters until he finds Yannick, but not in. Floater, Davis, speed. Boom. Brilliant offense from... Carolina. I mean, just the intricate passing in the backfield, waiting for the opportunities to get it to the cutters. Technical, touchy throw to close it out from Yannick. He has to get this way out in front, drops that shoulder down, puts it to where only Davis can get it to it. Really nice stuff. It's certainly not windy right now, but after not seeing the flag to our right move at all in the first half, saw it moving a little bit last point. Will Smolinski is our analyst on the sidelines. Is the wind a factor right now, Will? Uh, I wouldn't say so. That last point, there was like a small little gust, but nothing that I don't think any of these throwers can't handle or can't adjust to if it picks up and is a little bit more. I think the humidity is more of an issue. If anyone native to the D.C. area knows, like, it gets so sticky here in this twilight hour when the sun's setting and that humidity's there. Off the hands of Malks and then through the hands of Mataraju as the teams who have played so cleanly much of the night trade turnovers in the span of three seconds. They come in bunches sometimes, don't they? That just looked like it might have been tipped by Xander Wilcox on the around, but it got to Mox anyway. Here's Boxley being forced backhand, breaks the mark to Wodach, who's doubled. Scoobers, Boxley. Roy, up the line, Boxley. Oh, Nissen is wide open deep, and yet Roy and Boxley working together. Multiple slash cuts up the line, and now there's Nissen wide open, and he will land in the end zone. Flyers just totally forgot about Jock Nissen. Well, Jock, you mentioned how he was wide open on the fourth side, and it was after Boxley had looked him off for a reset, and then Nissen just slowly trailed to the opposite side of the field, and while all the attention was so focused, his defender had no idea which direction to go, whether he try and pressure and make sure that something happens in the attacking space or go cover Jacques, because all the attention was there on the front side, and as Jacques goes on the break side to give the hammer, I mean, there's just no one around him, and just smart, set up his feet, little jump in, and DC hanging in there, still within one. Second assist of the night for Christian Boxley. He does not have a goal yet in the game. Joe White is currently plus eight with six assists, three goals, and almost 500 total yards. We still have 4.40 to go here in the third quarter. Oh, 
Young's looking long. White versus McDonald. Incomplete. And nearly a Callahan. There was contact. And we heard a whistle. Holland and Lynch colliding. And it looks like Holland is saying no foul. Integrity rule wow. from D.C. to give this right back to the Flyers on the goal line. We saw Carolina on one side of the field get too greedy, pick up the disc early and try and throw it. Rowan, he had the opportunity to walk it up. Youngst lays out for the score. Missed opportunities for the Breeze. Yeah, you said it, Tyler. I mean, Rowan picks up, kind of pops the forehand into the air. And I thought Holland got fouled. It looked to me like he had made the completion that he'd caught the disc and then it got knocked out of his hands, but he said otherwise, overturning the call was an integrity call. And so great integrity, but Carolina able to come away with another hold. We have seen, well, look at this. No, he just missed it. It looked like he caught it, but he just didn't catch it. And I think that honestly, if we're talking about club level, that might be one of those dangerous play situations. Neither guy's looking at each other, both looking up at the disc. You can see the collision coming. And I mean, whether or not the defender actually touched him, I hey, mean, oh, the, I mean, the I mean. action of them coming toward together definitely played a factor yeah. in him trying to get that disc. We've seen Andrews Junks connect on deep shots in virtually every game he's played this year, unable to find White deep there, but it does work out okay for the Flyers as they maintain their two goal lead. DC back on O, three and a half to play in the third. Malks makes the nervy catch. Great switching from Raleigh. Almost forced a turnover. They've upped their game defensively tonight. No question about it. Nissen for Ort. Difficult throw, incomplete. Mitchell collided with Monroe. Mitchell was immediately signing signaling uncatchable and it didn't look like Monroe was asking for a foul either. So another break chance for Carolina. Flyers three of seven on breaks in the game. Oh the second time out for Carolina getting burned here. Interesting. Mike Denardis and the Flyers deciding to head toward the fourth with no timeouts remaining. But again, you know, there haven't been that many chances. Punch this in, get back up by three. You gotta feel pretty good about your opportunity at that point. And now it's time for our Domino's cheesy moment of the game. Domino's a proud partner of the DC Breeze here locally. Come here, see a game. Buy some pizza. They have their own personal pizzas up there for you. I think it's like five bucks. Very easy, get a drink, come over. I mean, that's all you need. You can come to a Breeze game, take public transit, you can get in and out, $25, that's is all it, you need. Is it true you can order it directly from their, your phone and they'll bring it to you? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Get the DC Breeze app here at Carolini right. Field, order it right down to your seat. 21st century technology <laughs> in effect. We've come a long way. Sure have. Now I just need Chad GPT to order it for me. <laughs> That's right. Siri, get me a pizza stat. No, Siri's, Siri's old news, Evan. That's true. <laughs> All right, out of the timeout. Flyers looking for their fourth break. McCutcheon doing a great job staying with Searles Bowes. Middle of the field, Edmonds the block. Gusho Hannes retreating. The huck goes up from Holland. Edmund sizes it up and scores! How what a sequence! That? Bookends for Edmonds! Big bookends, Evan. Crucial play, and they waste a Carolina timeout. There's the initial turnover, and then Edmonds able to come through and knock it away on the hanger. And then has to slow down just a little bit, shields the defender off, goes up with the right hand, and the crowd goes crazy. 
a gigantic swing. Again, with a chance to go up three, it's a one goal game, but that's even more demoralizing because they burned the timeout. Yeah, and now Carolina is going to have to go the rest of the way. DC with two timeouts. You know, you're down one, but you feel like you're kind of even because you know you're going to get that chance late. And the coaching decision by Daryl Stanley to pull Thomas Edmonds and put him down on that line. DC's O-line typically isn't seven guys. Typically it's about eight or nine, and it's four opportunities like that so that when the opposing team calls a timeout, you still have an offensive player, typically a thrower that's able to get the disc down the field and get opportunities like that, although Char Edmonds was the one receiving. Charlie, you're the official bookmaker of the broadcast. What do the live odds say right now? Flyers up one, but DC plus two in timeouts. I think I'd say Flyers about minus 180 right now, Evan. Minus 180. I don't know if it's that high. This game's virtually even. That's a foul. White bumped into by Bergeron. Joe's not in any particular hurry to get to the spot to restart this point. Catching his breath. Clock will stop if play hasn't begun with a minute to play. Yeah, but you can see mentally he's already working. He's seeing where his guys are, where the matchup is, who he wants. Way too easy there. I think there's just indecision by DC. Do they double team? Do they want to put pressure on the thrower? And the indecision led to just Yannick running right up the field. No one covering him. Assist number seven of the night for Joe White to go along with his three goals. And now over 600 yards of offense. You can watch every single AUDL game all season long on AUDL.TV. 144 regular season games plus the playoffs. There are 13 games this week, 13 games next week. The 2023 season is heating up. So get your AUDL.TV subscription today. I believe there's still a free one week trial. So you can sign up, get your first week for free and support the AUDL as we continue into our second decade. Great to have you with us for the first edition of Free Friday Frisbee this season. Evan Lepler, Charlie Eisenhood, Tyler Byram, Will Smolinski, our entire crew, and a contact foul on Ethan Bloodworth. He did not hand block Boxley cleanly there, even though for a split second I thought he did. DC will receive to start the fourth quarter. So a lot can happen in the next couple minutes. First, the end of quarter situation with Malks. They got time, but they need to be aware of the clock with 20 seconds to go. Monroe, still on his own side of the field. Roy angles it. Bloodworth can't get it. Wodash with eight seconds to Boxley. Airs it up high. Jump ball in the end zone. And it is tipped and incomplete. Matt Tucker got a piece of it for Carolina defensively. And the Flyers will take a two-goal lead into the fourth. It almost feels like a break for the Flyers. That's how good that defensive stand was to prevent D.C. from getting into the end zone with 35 seconds for that possession, amazing stuff. They, they kept them in their own half for more than half the time on the clock, forcing them to try to hurry something into the end zone. And Tucker makes the play, Carolina up two. from Nottingham, England, the World Flying Disc Federation's World Under-24 Ultimate Championships. Live all-access coverage, including semis and finals, exclusively at ultiworld.com.
Responsible business is now sort of a, an essential facet of the future economy. Like I'm talking like every business needs to start thinking about their social and, and especially environmental impact. And if we look at all the problems that we have in the world today, they're not going to be solved by our governments and the not-for-profits. I think business has a really big role to kind of play. B Corp really kind of helps companies through the certification really understand that and kind of dig into their impact further. Here's your district taco play of the game here entering the fourth quarter. Luke Rafis just leaving his feet. You see, perfectly horizontal. I mean, that's that's the USA Ultimate logo right there. Getting the D, forcing the turnover. DC had an opportunity to get a break there and come back in, but Carolina's offense, they're hanging strong and have a two-goal lead here in the fourth quarter. And we take the turn for home. 12 more minutes on the clock. The hometown fans hoping that the breeze can get back in this thing. They will start this fourth quarter on offense and Tobias Brooks unleashes the pull. And for those that may be new watching here, the pro league here on the AUDL level, or watching Ultimate Frisbee in general, just DC starting on offense here, it just shows how important that last point would have been for the Breeze to be able to score because if DC scored and then they punch it in here, we're tied up. Instead, now they're still playing a point behind. Bit of a moon ball from Wodach, but Boxley bailed him out on the shot up the line. Tyler Monroe in the middle of the field gets it back to Jacques Nissen. How about Kevin Pignoni and Jacques Nissen matched up in the quarterfinals five days ago in Ohio. They meet again in the AUDL on this Friday night in D.C. Monroe to Maltz. Less than a minute off the clock, and DC within one yet again. Just a nice, clean offensive possession to get things started. Johnny Maltz fired up. And a nice catch from Monroe along the sideline. Keep that possession alive. This game was tied 10-all when Ben Ort scored a break with 37 seconds to go in the half after a DC timeout. Flyers scored the final goal of the first half with eight seconds left and then scored the first two goals of the second half. And Carolina has had the lead ever since. DC running down on D, trying to change that. Kusho Hannes centers to Elijah Long. Joe White has been the fulcrum of this Flyers O-line tonight. Youngst sees Searles Bowes right back to White. Fairfax is wide open. DC's defense a little discombobulated there. Well, I think it was by design. I think they were just letting Fairfax just hang out on the break side. If a throw wanted to test it, there were guys within about 10, 15 yards of him. But then once they're finally able to break through, Joe White ends up wide open. Back in the hands of White. Youngst. Two defenders go with Long, which leaves Fairfax wide open on the goal line. That time it wasn't intentional. <laughs> nice hard charging cut up that open side to open up the space for Youngst to go back across the grain into the end zone. Seen a lot of backhand force tonight from both teams. Maybe trying to slow down those break throws. A little tougher to get the fast breaks off, but we've seen both teams able to break the mark with those backhands. First game of the weekend for Carolina. But when we talked to Mike Denardis about the dynamic of the doubleheader, says it's it's a totally different thing playing Friday night, Saturday night than if they were playing Saturday night, Sunday afternoon. And I, I thought that was an interesting point that uh, rings to be true. Like double headers are 
a whole lot different when you have that quick turnaround to an earlier mid-afternoon game the next day. Flyers won't play until 7 o'clock tomorrow night in Philly. It's been a positive change for the league, for sure, to, to get away from those Sunday afternoon games in general. And I think the doubleheader aspect is a big part of that. We are under 10 minutes. Pignoni again on Nissen. Here's Boxley. Up the line. Nissen keeps it alive. Didn't even have to leave his feet. Oh, good? no. Just when we're about to sing Jacques' praises, it just leaves his hand awkwardly. A turfed throw from Nissen gives Carolina the disc. Yeah, it almost looked like he was trying to holster the throw, and it slipped out of his hand. No timeouts for the Flyers, remember. Davish shoots it for Bloodworth. Battling with Malks. Bloodworth can't get it, but we got a foul. No argument from Johnny. Yeah, Johnny got himself in a bad position there against Bloodworth. Bloodworth had positioning the entire way. He was boxed out, and all Malks could do was either go up early and try and get him, maybe try and bait him into a throw, and Malks instead just went right through him. Bloodworth shaking up. He's going to leave the game. Gusho Hannes going to come back in. Rowan McDonald's charging onto the field for D.C. Jacques Nissen will depart in the one-for-one -one substitution. Huge sequence here with 8.43 to play. And Carolina stretched the lead back to three. Lucio Hannes back for Yannick. Davis, Yannick. Boom! Gusho Hannes catches the laser forehand from Yannick, and Carolina reasserts control. Yeah, the Breeze defenders were out of sorts. They tried to switch. Nobody followed the first cut, and then they never really caught up. See right there, uh, that was not, he wasn't trying to throw that. That fell, that fell out of his hands. And then Yannick, a little pump fake to open up the lane, and then snaps the forehand in there, and Gucho Hannes, longtime partner in crime, likes what he sees. And Rowan McDonald being pulled on to that point, the urgency being seen by Daryl Stanley, just how important that point was for it. I mean, when you look at the way the offense is rolling for Carolina right now, 82% hold percentage, 14 for 17. There aren't going to be many opportunities for the Breeze to be able to come back. So Daryl put all his eggs in one, or I wouldn't say all his eggs, but he put one egg in that basket to try and to get the point back. Uh, I think this is a, the small accumulations of Raleigh being just a touch better than D.C. has them now with a three-goal lead. Andrew Roy marked by the six-foot-five Andrew uh, Xander Wilcox. It's a collision downfield between Ort and Nakan. Everybody's okay. And now we got some contact that will reset the stall and center the disc for D.C. Double team coming for the Flyers. Big double team. Wilcox and Coffin back for Roy. Wide open, Wodach. And Edmonds found him. Yeah, D.C. offensively, they get in the red zone. They just want to spread the field. And typically, you hear about spreading the field is making your cuts and timing them out to the right time. D.C., what they do instead is they put guys literally in each corner of the field. So if you're going to try and put several bodies defensively in the middle, there's going to be someone open. And all it takes is one backfield throw, one swing, and then everyone's going to be open and there's going to be a score. And you see so much attention there on Boxley. But then once you saw that disc get swung back, Everyone bails out to try and find their guy. So DC pulling down two with seven and change remaining. Stanley.
Hanley calling the next O-line as his defense sets up a trap near the sideline, but not on the sideline. Again, they're going to pull into their bag of tricks right now. Historically, they haven't had too many of those. But recognizing the situation. All the way to Fairfax. Searles Bowes. I feel like Liam's had somewhat of a quiet night, befitting his personality, but when he's touched the disc, he's been very effective. Almost want to see the Flyers play through Liam a little bit more here in the fourth. Yeah, he, the last two games for him, he's had 927 total yards, which is the most on the team. And Tonight he's got a, you know, just over 200, which isn't bad, but he is not in the top four on his team. Fairfax back for White and Davis. Floater, White takes charge. White has to leave his feet. It's called complete. And then White throws it away. All right, he wants a call, but he's not going to get it. Yeah, I saw the official waving his hands initially, and I thought it was an incompletion from our vantage point. And I think it distracted White enough. I saw that too. Confused me. Yeah, I, I think he was waving off the foul. Oh, and a someone just got tossed. flyer was ejected on the sidelines. I think it was Will Coffin. Must have said something. You don't see this that often, but... Looked like Will Coffin, if I saw it correctly, just got tossed midway through this fourth quarter. And I wonder if it had to do with the, the waving of the either incompletion or no call. White obviously looking for something there on the sideline. And then, I mean, the, the crew that works DC, they are very cognizant of what players are saying. And that's one thing they want to keep in check as we now see head coach Mike Denard is coming out and talking with one of the head officials. Denard is signaling that he got hit on the arm. Now Daryl Stanley is going to get involved. Will Smolinski is on the sidelines. Will, what did you see and what did you hear? Yeah, so things ever since the Johnny Mulks in the, um, that deep play where there's a lot of contact, energy's been like pretty angry here on the DC sideline or at least like contentious and and what's been happening is the players have been kind of chirping at the field a little bit more than we usually see that 10 yard penalty was actually on the DC sideline right before this and I didn't hear what Coffin said but it's obvious that the officials have been paying attention to what's been being shouted at them well, certainly if it was Coffin and we presume it was he said something akin to some magic words. It is this the foul, right? So that's the question. White thinks he got hit. And uh, nothing could we'll see much that's, there, yeah. yeah. All right. Flyers down one defender. DC with a break chance. Closing in on five minutes to play here in the fourth. Just when you thought this rivalry wasn't quite spicy enough. Remember, DC has two timeouts. Dangerous throw off Holland's fingertips. Flyers disc. Back to White, sprawled on the field. Aggressive bid for McDonald, came up empty. White. Picking this Breeze defense apart, connecting with Fairfax. Flyers by three, under five minutes to play. What a crazy point, Evan. Which part? And that feels like a backbreaker. I mean, there it is again. That's what White says he got hit. You know, you don't see much there on the replay, but ultimately it ends up as a DC turnover either way. And Joe White, you know, uncovered, what are they doing? He's able to just lob one into the end zone and he has just been on fire. And walking off there at the end of that point, David Bloodgood turned over his right shoulder and was chirping a little bit with the Carolina sideline too. So 
some tense moments here on both sides. Well, look, these two teams aren't in the same division, but they have played each other quite a few times through the years. Interdivisional matchups in 2017 and 2018. They met three times in 2021 when they were in the Atlantic Division together. And now this is the second meeting this year. When I talked to Daryl Stanley before the season, he was really excited to have multiple meetings against the Flyers. It's not just like one game and winner take all. Although, I don't know how Daryl feels about having the rematch now after he got the first meeting back in late April. Nine assists now tonight for Joe White. I mean, the proximity of these two teams, too. I mean, D.C. and Raleigh in the North Carolina area, I mean, that is closer than half of the divisional matchups for D.C. Same can be said for Carolina, too, in the South Division. Yeah, that's a great point. The quality of these two teams, they're going to be in the mix for championship weekends and interdivisional showcases for years to come. End zone, Boxley scores. Well, they're holding strong, but they're going to have to find something try to get this game level. They still got those two timeouts, but they don't do you any good sitting in your pocket. Yeah, I think that last point where DC was able to get the turn, the contentious point that we were talking about, that was the last leash that Daryl Stanley had for his D-line. I think next time we see a turnover, we're going to see that O-line get subbed in. But the thing is, too, they're down by two points. In order to win this game, the D-line is going to have to score for DC. Flyers offense back out there. Merriman's pull floating toward the back corner of the end zone where Gusho Hannes receives it. Long around Rafis to Fairfax. Do some contact on the throw, play on. Could be a foul on Bergeron there, colliding with Lynch, again no whistle. Gusho Hannes. What the heck is this? Certainly doesn't hurt the Flyers if they score, but as long as they maintain possession, they don't need to score. Searles Bowes, who he had, Youngs, but he chose to send it back to midfield for Fairfax and bleed more precious seconds off DC's clock. Low throw, snagged nicely by Jungst. DC's got to force the issue here. Joe White looking for his 10th assist of the night. Jungst has it. Anders saying so long. See you all next year, he says. This is the last matchup between these two teams. and. Wow, that's been a spicy one tonight. One minute and 15 seconds. That's how long it took for Carolina to punch it in, and they were in no rush to do so. Taking their time, knowing the game score, knowing what is needed, and they just milked that clock until finally they felt they just had to punch it in and score. I, I, I don't want to be hyperbolic here, but the game Joe White has had tonight from a scoring and yardage standpoint, it's one of the best regular season games in the history of this league. I mean, he, he's over 450 receiving yards. He's over 300 throwing yards. He's been involved in 13 scores. He's completed 50 passes. Those are special numbers that you don't see very often. What do we got here? No one seems to know what's going on other than that one official who made the call. Now the rest of his crew trying to be clued in. Clock stopped with 2.17 remaining. Perhaps DC didn't 
initiate possession from the right spot. Can't think of what else it might be. So it's half the distance to the goal. Which is going to go one, two. Is it 10 yards back? Yeah. It's half the distance to the goal. One, just right here. You're going to be on the side. Yeah. All right. Three, two, one. I have not seen a half the distance to the goal call before in an AUDL game. Oh, and it wasn't even half the distance to the goal. It was half the distance to the back line. That's right. <laughs> Near the sideline, Malks ruled in bounds. Bit of a delayed call, but DC plays on. Malks takes the shot. Ort going deep, and he beats Knockin. 146 left. Breeze within two. And DC needs to do something nifty defensively here to have a chance. Well, DC scored relatively quickly, but it took a whole 13, 15 seconds for us to figure out what was going on over there. So. They get the point, they're able to get down the field, but that clock is not on DC side right now, and they, their defense has to do something to force an early turnover. Nice deep shot from Malks. He's started to fire some good hucks in this one, but of course, as you say, Tyler, it's all gonna come up to the defense here. And DC opting for speed on this line over height. No A.J. Merriman, no Musa Cha. Long picks up, gets it to Searles Bowes away from the sideline. Entering tonight through the first five weeks of the season, there had only been five instances of a player recording 300-plus receiving yards and 300-plus throwing yards in a game. Only one of those five players did it in one. That was Salt Lake's Jacob Miller. A stall was called on Jungst. I don't believe it. DC is going to have the disc after a timeout on the goal line with over a minute to play and a chance to make it a one goal game. We got to see that again. And Daryl Stanley had to call that timeout because the clock was still rolling. We weren't under a minute yet. So it was still rolling. And again, DC has to score two goals now in a minute and 13 seconds. So it's here. It's one. Two, three, four, five. I, yes, I don't know that's how quick. that got to seven. I'm with you, Charlie. Tough whistle there for Carolina. And now, you know, if they can punch in a quick break, yeah. plenty of time left to get level. And they pulled Rowan McDonald over to the offensive line group, which I mean, I think they have to at this point. Well, you want his throwing ability in the red zone because he can score you a point very quickly with one of his many creative throws. And he's got like 75 of them, I think. I, I've counting. lost track. Looks like Carolina's not going to double team Malks on the mark. Boxley and Davis. Side by side, front of the end zone. Swing for Edmonds to Roy. The quicker the Breeze score, the better chance they have to get another break that they'll need. Roy floats it. Or it comes to it, scores. Exactly one minute remaining on the stadium clock in a one goal game. A nice execution for DC out of the timeout. They didn't try to go too fast. They had a plan. They wanted to swing the disc. It wasn't there. They swung it back across. Ort was open in the end zone. Nice job to come to the disc there and not allow the defender to make a play. Late quarter situations have not gone the way of the breeze in this game. End of the third quarter, they had a chance to punch one in, get within one before the break. We had at the end of halftime, DC unable to get the disc and be able to score in that opportunity. So how are they going to perform here in the final minute of this game and get one back? You're right on, Tyler. Flyers have scored the final goal in each of the first three quarters. If this disc hits the ground and becomes a turnover to give it back to the breeze, this place is going to go crazy. 
Now the Flyers can score and go up by two and almost clinch the game that way, or they can just play keep away. Swing, long, two hands. Think about the extra pressure of the short stall count. No timeouts, too, for the Flyers if they get in a jam. Rafe is stride for stride, but Gush Johannes has it. We're under 30 seconds. Fairfax bluffs the deep throw. And now no Reset. backfield turnovers. Oh, nearly anticipating it was Merrill, but he can't get there. Long and Gush Johannes play catch. Hammer to a wide open white That's with ball game. seven seconds. He caught it with seven seconds left. White is going to throw it one more time, and that is it. Carolina gets its revenge after an opening day loss to the Breeze and wins on D.C.'s home field 20-19 to to launch week six in this exhilarating AUDL season. That gets them to four and two in the South Division. That ties them in second place with the Austin Soul, against whom they have a head-to-head -head win and the tiebreaker right now. So they move into basically the two spot in the East, just a half game back of Atlanta. And these are two teams at the beginning of the season. The question was, who's going to challenge New York this year? And when both these teams looked at these interdivisional games, Carolina, D.C. was like, this is, besides going against New York, which D.C. gets to do one more time this season, this was one of the matchups where they would be able to size up and see, can they be a championship caliber contender? Can they contend against the behemoth that is New York? And so and they're one and one. Both teams were able to get a win. Both teams showed that they were up to the task. Both teams winning on the road. It also says something about the Flyers. Yes, they've become more of a complete team since the first couple weeks of the season, but they lose to D.C. and Atlanta, and since then they have avenged both of those losses since starting 0-2. And for D.C., though, I, I think many would agree D.C. is probably the second-best team in the East Division, New York, trailing them. But there's a long way to go, and Boston is undefeated. The games still have to be played, and we've already seen that Philadelphia, they can test this D.C. team. They only lost to D.C. by one here in Carlini Field, so they have a matchup upcoming. D.C., they do not have much wiggle room for the rest of the season if they're going to want to be able to get the number two seed in the East Division this year. Player of the game with 10 assists, three goals, and almost 800 total yards. Is Joe White. Joe's wearing the headset down on the sideline. Joe, before we talk about your game, what was this one like to play tonight in terms of intensity and, and just high level ultimate for you and your team? Oh, I mean, it's, it's hot as hell out here. My calves are cramping by quarter two. So that's about all it was. It was all grit, just winning unders after like first six minutes of the first half. We knew that they were fronting our guys, so we just had to go win the disc over and over and over again. So really tough, a super fun game. What was the biggest difference tonight? How do you feel this Carolina team has grown since losing to DC back in week one? Uh, we got the college guys back, uh, moved some personnel around. We got Alex and Siraj playing D now, I'm playing O. Um, I mean, everything just like seemed way smoother. No stupid mistakes that game. Like we just kept throwing it away in this game. It just felt like tightening it up. I mean, the college guys really help because they're coming off like a super polished May. So we're just following their lead, you know, as the old guys who are just getting into it this summer. Joe, you looked very comfortable out there on offense tonight. Uh, you know, you had the two turnovers, although you didn't think one of them was a turnover. Uh, what what made you feel so confident out there tonight? Oh, I mean, I always play with confidence. You know that, Charlie. <laughs> I'm always going to go out there, take shots. Um, but it's just, it's easy when the unders start coming fast, you get a bunch of touches, and then it's all rhythm from there. So, same as every game. All right, Joe, thanks for your time. Congrats on the win. We'll let you go. We'll see you tomorrow in Philly. Joe White, a fantastic all-around game, finishing with 784 total yards. He's the second player in the AUDL this year to have over 300 receiving over 300 throwing and win the game. Two guys in 50 AUDL games have done that.
Jacob Miller for Salt Lake, Joe White tonight. Man, those are not cheap stats out here tonight. I mean, he was really driving the offense, making the tough throws, making the big plays, and yeah, special stuff. Hope you enjoyed the game as the Flyers win it by one on the road. So many highlights, so many great individual battles back and forth, but in the end, Carolina was just a little bit better, and they win it 20 to 19. One reminder, AUDL.TV, watch every single AUDL game all season long for less than 10 bucks a month. Get your subscription today. Thanks for joining us on our free Friday Frisbee mega cast for Charlie Eisenhood, Tyler Byram, Will Smolinski down on the field, and our entire crew. Evan Lepler saying good night from DC as the Flyers win it here on the road.